last five weeks we've been doing a, a series on Joseph, and I hope you have all enjoyed that. I think Joseph is, um, the story of Joseph biblically is one of the greatest stories in the Bible, in my opinion. I love teaching it, preaching it. I love learning from it. Amen? Hallelujah. Joseph goes through all these terrible things for, at that time, two-thirds of his life. Injustices, cruelties, all these terrible, terrible, terrible things are happening to him over and over again. He has not asked for any of it, but he got it all. But God was using it for his glory and his purpose. And the hope is that in our own lives, when we go through really bad things, bad things still happen to good people, but sometimes bad things happen because we're doing bad things. We, we, we make bad decisions, and we, we have to learn from them. And that's what it's all about. If the story of our lives is told many years from now, what will people remember about each and every one of us? What will they remember? My prayer is that we're going to be able to leave earth, amen, and we're going to be able to leave a testimony of God's grace. In 1 Peter 1.7, hallelujah, 1 Peter 1.7, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise, glory, and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Let me say this. You're going to suffer in this world. We might as well suffer in a purpose. Because you're going to suffer. People who think that they're, they're never going to suffer, people who think they're going to sidetrack suffering, it never works. We are going to go through tribulations in this world. We either make them count or they don't. I don't believe that any person in this sanctuary today that your destiny is worthlessness. That when it's all said and done, your life was worthless. I believe that your life is, is to be full of worth. Amen? Hallelujah and purpose. It's interesting because he said these trials have taken place in your life so that your faith is genuine. Is your faith genuine? Hallelujah. Now, it's interesting because in that verse... Genuineness appears to be the summation. The testing and trials that you've gone through is so that your faith is genuine. Peter is talking to believers and he's encouraging them so that they understand that what they've gone through has a purpose. There is a design even to the suffering in our lives. There is a design to the trials. There is a design to the dis disappointments. And Lord knows they come, and sometimes they come in bunches. But let's be fair with God. If we're honest with God and ourselves, we'll see all the blessings that actually do surround us. But sometimes we're so busy looking at what's wrong, we can't see the multitude of things that are right in our lives. Amen? Through some good, bad, and ugly, we can make it through. We make it through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm reminded of the verse in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8. I love this verse. I love this verse. The end of the matter is better than its beginning, than the beginning. And patience is better than pride. The end of the matter is better. We all get excited about starting something. But I want to be honest with you. It's how you finish. Anybody can start something and be all excited but it's how we finish. Amen? It doesn't matter if the Browns score 70 points in the first quarter when they give up 85 the rest of the game. It doesn't matter. Hallelujah. Hey, did you get, hey, Chris, did you get to shoot uh, the fireworks off at the, at the okay, at, uh, wasn't that at uh, the Cleveland, I, 
you did it at the Browns game. He he knows the guy that pushes the button, I guess, for the fireworks, and Chris got to push the didn't push it often, but you did push it. Hallelujah. Once, one time. All right, hallelujah. Amen. But isn't it true? It doesn't matter how good it starts. There's something about that when we finish a task, there's something about the attitude and the residue, what is left behind. It is so sad to see sometimes people start with such excitement, and then by the time they're done, it's so discouraging the way that sometimes we go out of something. In life, life is a series of coming in and going out. It's entrance and it's exits. The exits become more important than the entrance. Amen? Because the exit is the summation of what has taken place. Hallelujah. In 2 Samuel 22, 26, it says this. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. Now, there's a neat truth here. Hallelujah. Let's look at it. When you obey and do his word, his character is made more clear. Do you notice that when you backslide, it's very hard to recognize and even appreciate the character of God? But when you begin to obey God, when you begin to follow him, you start to see things in a much clearer realm. It's, it's awesome when we obey. Let me give you an example. We interface with the Holy Spirit of God when we obey. Now in John 14.30, look what it says. John 14.30. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world come, cometh and have nothing in me. This is Jesus speaking. He's talking about the devil, the prince of this world, the world is covered, according to Ephesians, the second chapter. The world is covered, and I don't like saying this, but it's what the Bible teaches. Wish it wasn't true. The Bible is technically, not the Bible, but the world is covered with a demonic layer. There is an evil tendency globally. Isn't that true? Because you wonder, how do these crazy things happen out there in the world? You know, people can be at a traffic stop sitting in a light and Somebody get out of a car and start beating up somebody in the next car, and pretty soon 15 other people join in. And, and, and there's times that people get killed in situations where two minutes ago there was no problem at all. It's, it's a spirit of, 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 of evil that, that resides, covers the earth. And Jesus, when he came, he preached. And he said, on earth as it is in heaven, meaning that when we preach the gospel, when we live the gospel, we are able then to bring the presence of God to bear into an atmosphere. I remember at Lake County Speedway, many, many times the racers, and Chris, I don't know if you'll back this up, but I would have the owner sometimes tell me, he says, man, I wish you guys were here last week. I go, what? He goes, all H-E-L-L -L broke out in the pits. He goes, when you guys are here, we don't have as much trouble. I don't know what it is, but when you guys are here, it's, it's always a little more peaceful. And, and many times, that I've had multitudes of times that even racers would come up and say, wish you guys would come here more often. <laughs> because there's something about people just losing it, losing it. And, but we bring an atmosphere of peace. And when the peace of God is there, the, the, the demonic that is trying to aggravate is held in check because something far greater and it has superiority in authority over that demonic lair. This is why whenever a community truly enters into a revival, the crime rate goes down, dr drunk driving goes down, wife beating goes down, drug addiction goes down, suicides start to disappear. Why? Because, because there is an atmosphere that is holy in that community. There's a hope of God. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus said that the prince of this world has what? Nothing in me. What does that mean? Well, let me look, let's look at something. Satan couldn't interface with Jesus. Because why? Because nothing in Jesus resembled him. Whoa. So when the devil tried to tempt Christ, I hate to say it, Christ was truly tempted, okay? The devil did the best he could. 
but there was nothing in Christ that resembled the tempter. Now here's our problem. So when you are tempted, who responds? The man of flesh or the son of man? In other words, when you truly accept Christ, you have the power when, when those demons are inviting you, they're tempting you, you have the power through Christ to say no. Many of you have overcome unbelievable obstacles because of your faith. There are people sitting here this morning, you should have been dead. Amen? You should have been dead. You know where you were, but now you know where you is. Hallelujah. Amen? Praise God. Amen. So let's look at this. Romans 7.22 says this, For in my inner being I delight in God's law. Hallelujah. In my inner being I delight in God's law. The outer man doesn't necessarily delight in the law of God. The carnal flesh does not feel like worshiping God. The carnal flesh doesn't feel like early on Sunday to get up and really fool the devil and even, you know, surprise, surprise the devil, and even come early for Sunday school. No, the flesh wants to watch TV, read the paper, whatever, whatever, get to church, maybe. And then some weeks, the flesh doesn't want to come to church at all. In fact, if how I felt on Sunday morning determined whether or not I came to church every Sunday, I'd be here about 35% of the time. I'm not here because I feel like it. I obey first. Once I obey, and you say, I, I remember this. This is a true story, probably. But this, this, yeah. This guy was sleeping in one morning, you know. Finally, his mother came to his room and said, Bobby, get up. Get up. Get your butt out of bed. It's time to go to church. I'm not going to church. She goes, I'll give you five more minutes. She comes back in five minutes. She slams on the door. And she goes, you got to get to church. He goes, I don't want to go to church. Those people don't like me. She goes, whether they like you or not, you've got to get to church. He goes, I don't like those people. Um, there's a lot of strange people there. Well, you're strange too. Just get dressed and get to church. Well, I don't like those people because sometimes they're just not real spiritual. Well, you're not being real spiritual either. Now get your clothes on and get to church. And he goes, Mom, give me one reason that I've got to get dressed and go to church. Because you're the pastor. Now get dressed and get to church. <laughs> oh, trust me. That's a true story. Okay? Amen. What am I saying? I'm saying that there's times when we obey, the flesh does not cooperate. Your emotions do not completely align. Okay? We're not all humming on the top of the mountain together. Okay? Hallelujah. We're not trying to find... Uh, there's no, you got to understand that mankind is not capable of oneness. You can have Earth Day, you can hum... And, do yoga and all that all, till, the, till the cows come home, my friends. You're not going to have oneness. You're not going to have oneness. I'm, it's fascinating, too, in India, some of the, uh, the monks. I saw that a riot broke out several months ago with a bunch of monks. <laughs> the ones that are teaching everybody how to, <laughs> whatever, you know. They're there teaching everybody how to be tranquil and be one with the universe and everything, and they're beating the crap out of each other. Do you see that on the news? It was a riot. Now, what does that tell you? Men, men are not capable of being one. Now, we can be in agreement like when um, the Indians won the World Series. Oh, if they did. Wait a minute. Um, if Cavs, when the Cavs won the championship, you had a million people in the street. That's cool. And, and, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So we can find something to agree with. But once we get beyond the excitement of the victory, then we have to live with each other. And men don't do real good with that. People do not really get along that well. We're doing pretty good, but overall we don't. 
The only oneness can come in Christ. Because only Christ can give mankind the power to overcome prejudice, to overcome hatred, to overcome all the things, all the things that you don't like about people. God loves all those people you don't like. If it was up to you before you knew Christ to be around all these people this morning, you might have made a different decision. You sit in a donut shop, I've done it, and people start coming in, and and there'll be six, seven people, and there's three out of seven of them you don't like. Right off the bat, I don't like that guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat this donut and get this coffee in here quick. I'm out of here. Okay? Well, church, you see, you can pick and fr- choose your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives. Amen? So when the church gets just the way you want it, trust me, the Lord's going to mess with it. He'll bring somebody in that's going to aggravate you a lot. And the problem might not be with that person at all. The problem is with you. You want the church to be a certain way. You only want your country club. But Christ has called this to be a hospital of souls. And people that are injuring and hurt come in. And you might have been healed a long time ago, but you still don't get far enough away from the emergency room to remember what it was like to come in with those broken bones and a broken heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, let's look at second. I'm going to pass this up on purpose. Let's go to, because time is of the essence here. All right? Let's go to Luke 22. Luke 22. We're going to close here in a little bit. Did you hear about the pastor? Not pastor. Did you hear about little Bobby went to church? He'd never been to church before. Yeah. I'm looking right at you, brother. Hallelujah. His name's Bobby. Okay. All right. It's Chris. It's Chris. All right. So Chris went to church for the first time with Mrs. Smith. And he's looking around. He's wondering what things are. You know, what do things mean, you know? So he's pulling her thing. Hey, what, what, what does it mean when that table up there and has some things on? Oh, that's, that's where they put the communion. Communion trays and everything. That's where they have communion. I'll tell you about that later. Okay. So he's looking around. What's that cross up on the front? Why is that cross there? He says, well, that's to remind us that Jesus died on the cross. Okay. That's what that means. So a little bit later, it's kind of going long. You know what I mean? The service is really going long. Kind of going long and longer and long. Long. And then Bobby pulled Mrs. Smith's thing and says, Hey, Chris, yeah, Chris, pulled it. I gotta get over here. I gotta see Chris. Hallelujah. All right. Amen. Pulls thing and says, What does it mean when the pastor says in closing? And she looked down and lodged, she said, Doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> Amen. All right. Now, Luke 2. 2232. <laughs> Chrissy wanted to know what it meant. He found out. All right. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now let's look at that verse. This is the night at the Last Supper. This is towards the end of the supper. And, and Jesus says this to Simon. Simon Peter. Right? Now let's look at the King James Version. But I prayed for thee that they that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I like the King James Version better. Because believe it or not, Peter was a believer in the Lord, but we but in a way, if you think about it, we all go through tests that prove whether or not we will be genuine. Isn't that true? You can think that you're really into something. And when the cost gets to a certain point, there's many times you back away. There's organizations or clubs or things out in the world that you're, you're interested, you get a little close, but, you, but you'll say, and this isn't wrong, you'll just say, listen, that is, I, I am not getting more involved than I am. This is as much as I'm giving and that's it. So G, Peter, he was a believer. He's going to find out that he has weakness, even though he thinks he's strong. And let's look at it. 
Jesus said he has prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail. Now, i got to be honest with you. If anybody's going to pray for you, if it's Jesus, that's a good thing. Amen? So when Jesus said to Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. That is a good thing. However, let's keep going in the story here. Luke 22, 33, 34. But he replied, Lord, this is Peter speaking, I am ready. I am ready to go. And I'll die for you. I'll go to prison and to death. But what did Jesus say? He answered back and he said, I tell you before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Peter just told Jesus, I will die for you. And Jesus says back, before the night is over, within hours, you will deny me three separate times. Hmm. Okay, so Peter will deny the Lord three times, but when he does, what then will he do? Because we know he denied the Lord three times, right? In Luke twenty-two sixty to 62, Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And that was his third time. And just as he was speaking, look what happened. The rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter was... Jesus was just coming out from the courtroom and the outer court, they had to bring Christ through. And what timing? Just as Peter denies Jesus three times, they've got Jesus by the arm and they're taking him through this courtyard. And the rooster crows and Peter looks up and there's Jesus being led away to die for our sins. Then Peter remembered the word that the Lord spoke to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. You see, what would Peter do? Anybody here ever fail? What will you do when you fail? What have you done when you failed? Peter failed. He failed miserably, but what is he going to do? There was someone else of the 12 that failed as well. They had already left the supper because it was Judas Iscariot. What is Judas going to do? He's going to go out and commit suicide. That's what Judas is going to do. He hangs himself. What is Peter going to do? He went out and he wept bitterly. Peter weeps bitterly. But where does he go from there? How many struggle at times? You don't have to tell me. But is there anyone here that is able to easily forgive yourself when you're really stupid sometimes? Is there anyone here that's been able to master the art of self-forgiveness? Because Peter had to make a decision. Do I begin to even forgive myself or do I somehow say to myself, I have blown it beyond redemption. I have blown it beyond any capacity to clean up the mess that I've made. And a lot of people, they, they, don't, they don't go a little bit further. They stop there and they stay in that, that, that sewer, in essence, of, of self-condemnation. Jesus didn't come to die on the cross so that we would condemn ourselves. He died on the cross so that we could be set free from even our own condemnation, our own self-condemnation. What's more the condemnation from anybody else in the world? Amen. So is this the trial or test that will in fact convert Peter? Because how he handles this determines whether or not, in essence, he's converted. Because this is a test. Now, Peter didn't know he was going to have a test a few hours ago, and isn't that sometimes how life happens? Because sometimes things happen, you go, Pastor, it's the last thing in the world I ever expected. But sometimes we're in the middle of things. We didn't ask for, but we're there. 
we're there. Something happens, somebody says something, and now you got, we've all got choices to make. Wow. Genuine faith. Mark 16, 7. When Jesus rose again from the dead, remember he told the women that came, remember to give the, oint the ointments and stuff? They came and they found Jesus risen from the dead. And what did the angels tell them? Go tell his disciples and who else? Wow. Didn't say tell John, Mark, Matthew, all these other guys. Go tell Peter. <laughs> he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Praise God. Woo. This is good. But we're missing something. Well, what's the big deal? The big deal is. After Peter wept, he didn't leave the fellowship. He was with the other apostles to get the message. Was he distraught? Yes. Was he disappointed? Yes. I believe that he wept over and over again, and the other apostles were trying to comfort him. But when they get the word, he's risen from the dead, tell the apostles, and Peter! Wow. Now later on we see in the Bible that John and Peter get to what? Run, run, run to the sepulcher to see that his body is not there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Little track meet. Amen? Woo! Glory to God. He didn't check out. He pressed in. Because when you're, you're going to go through stuff, so you've, we all got a choice. Don't check out. Press in. Checking out's the easiest thing in the world. A million people at once can do that. Be like them salmon men. They, they go upstream. Hallelujah. They're a sight to see. Any old fat carp can just go along with the stream, but it it takes, a, you know, it takes a strong fish to go against the stream. Amen? And when fishermen go fishing, I'll be honest, if they got a choice between a seven-pound fat carp that's just been eating dough balls or to catch one of those fish that have been going upstream, let me tell you something. There ain't, there ain't much effort to get the carp. All you got to do is just take a dough ball, stick it. You don't even have to throw it out. The carp will just come to shore. You know, if you really don't want to fish, that's how you fish. Am I right? Real fishermen, right? No, you like, you like a fight. You like a fish that's got some gusto. You like a fish that's coming flying out of the water, man. And how they do it when you see it on TV and stuff. Some of those fish fly ten against the grain, hallelujah. Let me tell you, they should teach us, hallelujah, how to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen, because we're to go upstream, and, and we're hallelujah. And that's why, that's why God wants to catch us. That's why Jesus told Mark, you'll no longer catch fish, you'll catch men. Oh, I didn't know that segue was going to work there, hallelujah. Praise God. Woo, revelation, amen. He pressed in. Peter passed his test. He passed his test. We're not done. Let's open our Bibles. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Now remember when I was talking about interfacing earlier, how Jesus, when the devil tempted Jesus, there was nothing in him. That's our problem. When we're tempted, we still, we don't have I'm not going to say enough Jesus because we do, but we still allow the enemy to interface with our, with our sinful nature. So when the devil's tempting us, he's looking for something that, re, that resembles himself. He literally is looking at you like a mirror and he wants to see how much of himself he sees. But here's the good news. When you truly trust Christ and love him and serve him, you can look, trust me, the Lord can look 
the Lord can look into you and he can see himself. See, the Holy Spirit interfaces with your heart, the inner man. Amen? So in Acts 2.14, this is pretty cool. Remember Peter? All right, he failed. Then all of a sudden on the day of Pentecost, 120 are in the upper room. God pours out the Holy Spirit, amen? Yeah. Right? Thousands of people are standing around. They, see, they hear the noise. They see these people coming out of the upper room, all lit up in the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. They're speaking in tongues. They're speaking in at least 14 languages that they never learned, hallelujah. It's a supernatural endowment of power. They're happy. Some of them look like they're drunk, even though it's only 9 in the morning, hallelujah. And, and, and some of them say, ah, they're all drunk. And others said, no, I think this is of God. And who is it that's going to stand up and clean up the mess? Of, of complexity and confusion. Thank you. Hallelujah. Then Peter stood up with the 11. Let's stand as we, let's stand. Hallelujah. Peter stood up, we'll stand up. Hallelujah. Look at that. Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. He stands up in front of thousands of people. He stood warming his hands at the enemy's fire. And now he stands before thousands. And he commands them to listen. He gets their attention. And he says, let me explain it. Listen carefully to what I say. Wow. Uh, what, what was it a few weeks before? He wept bitterly because he denied the Lord. Now, now, out of all the apostles, he's the one who stands and starts the New Testament church. He preaches the first New Testament message in the sense of after Christ is risen from the dead. The whole thing starts with Peter's proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. That, my friends, is a pretty cool turnaround. Amen? It didn't take five, 15 years of counseling. It didn't take 14 boo-hoo parties. It didn't take all the things that sometimes we employ for ourselves when we're disappointed. All it took was a broken heart that God could put back together. His heart was broken but he passed the test. Let me tell you, when God takes something that's broke, he puts it back together. And you know, sometimes when bones are broken and they fuse back together, did you know, they, many times I've heard this, that they're stronger than they were before? Trust me, the Lord, imagine how strong we could be if we honestly, truly give our lives to the Lord and serve him. Because we got a lot of broken stuff that we can give to the Lord. And if it, when it's healed, if it's honestly going to be stronger than it was before, that's cool. We can go with that. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you and praise you. Lord, I love the message of redemption. I love it when you change your life. I love it when you, when you change my life. I love it when all through this sanctuary, there's do countless dozens of people in this sanctuary. I knew many of you before you knew Christ. Now I know you in Christ. I've seen God change your life. I know what, where you came from. But praise God, now we know where we're going. And God, you have done a miracle in our lives. Is there anyone here this morning who would say, Pastor Jim, it's my turn for that miracle this morning. I need, I need to give my life to the Lord. Amen? Anyone else? Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Raise your hand. Say, Pastor Jim, that's me. I need to get right with God or I need to come to the Lord for the first time. One or the other. One or the other. Anyone else? Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Brother, up here. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Let's get right. Get right. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. I want you to rejoice and be glad in it. 
The church is full of imperfection. I want every, we have many visitors here. I want to promise you, if you want an imperfect church, you found it. You found it because we're just, we're honest. We don't play religious, we're not going to play some religious hokey pokey with you and, you know, we, we, we are what we are, and you'll see us as we kind of are. And there's, there's I'm telling you, man, guys that are in the cars, have you ever seen a car right after they paint it? Sometimes it looks horrendous because they're not done yet. You got 20 more hours of rubbing all that bad boy out before it really shines, amen? And Lord's rubbing stuff out. He's rubbing stuff in as he's getting stuff out, Amen? Father, we want to thank you and praise you. And God, I pray for my brothers that raise their hands for rededication. Let them, God, experience your grace afresh. Help them to, to walk in you, to simply know through their trials, through their troubles, through the tragedies that have even taken place in their lives. Let them understand that all things do work together for good to those who love God. So God, may we love you to get to the place to where it's working for good. We thank you and we praise you for this beautiful day, Lord, that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah.